Welcome to Biblical Foundations, a podcast of the Center for Biblical Studies at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. I'm your co-host, Jimmy Rowe, along with Dr. Andreas Kostenberger. Join us as we discuss issues in biblical scholarship for the church. Today, our guest is Dr. Ben Witherington. Um, we're here to talk with him about uh, various subjects, but, but primarily uh, on the topic of biblical theology and his new book, Biblical Theology, The Convergence of the Canon. Uh, ben, uh, great to have you with us today. My pleasure. Glad to be able to share with you. Yes. Uh, listen, you're one of the few, if, if not the only, living scholars who've written commentaries in every book of the New Testament, not to mention other you know, thematic uh, studies and then even uh, personal books uh, as well. And now you've capped off your publishing career with a biblical theology uh, subtitled The Convergence of the Canon. Uh, just want to congratulate you. I know your book has already received some awards. It's it's a remarkable achievement. Uh, I uh, I think in in your book you say that it's 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 wise to wait till uh, your mature years, uh, you know, before you tackle such such a subject. And I I wholeheartedly agree with that. I I, I must say, reading your book, I felt it had a a, a, a touch of memoir built in. <laughs> Just because you've uh, you've studied at Durham, you can maybe tell our listeners a little bit about you know some of the uh, the places and the people that you interfaced with in the you know in the uh, course of your career. So, um, as we begin our conversation, can you perhaps reflect a bit on on your career and and how it culminated in your biblical theology? Sure. Well, when I went off to Carolina, I mean I had been. You know, I'd grown up in the church, in the Methodist Church in North Carolina. And uh, I, you know, I really didn't anticipate going to Carolina being a religion major or anything like that. In fact, I thought I was going to go into pre-med. That's until I ran into organic chemistry at a graduate level. <laughs> you know? So I, I ended up being an English major. But the person who most influenced my studies in life while I was at Carolina was Dr. Bernard Boyd, who was an Old Testament scholar from Princeton and and uh, just a riveting lecturer and preacher. I mean, he was, there were people sitting in the windows from 70 to 74 and before that as, and after as well to get to hear Dr. Boyd. And, and really the Bible really came alive for me under his tutelage. And I kind of realized, well, I guess I'd better go to seminary, you know, and uh, learn some more about this. And uh, I mean, I had been very fortunate. Um, public schools in High Point were incredible. I started Spanish in the third grade. I took Latin in junior, senior high. I studied classics. I mean, you know, I mean, it was a very it's more like a classical Christian education today in some ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, so after I got to the end of my college career, I went and visited Princeton. And uh, the, and I also visited Gordon-Conwell Seminary in South Hamilton, Massachusetts. And, and I, the one professor I really wanted to study with at Princeton was Bruce Metzger. But uh, there weren't a lot of other folks there that I was really all that excited about. And when I went to Gordon-Conwell, I mean, my very first year there, there was Andrew Lincoln, there was Gordon Fee, there was David Scholler, there was Ramsey Michaels. It mm. was sort of an investment of riches. In addition to which, there was the BTI, the Boston Theological Institute, where you could take courses cross-listed at any of the seven seminaries in the greater Boston area. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I went to Gordon-Conwell, and I went to Harvard and studied with Christopher Stendhal on Romans. And, you know, it was an embarrassment of riches. I just, I couldn't take enough mm -hmm. New Testament classes when I was at Gordon-Conwell with those folks. And uh, eventually said, they said, you know, Ben, you've taken 13 classes in New Testament. You should go and do something else for a while. <laughs> So, you know, I took a bunch of Old Testament classes and, and eventually I got an MDiv degree, not just an MA in biblical studies, yeah. because I had felt called to both preach and teach. Mm -hmm. And so I was pursuing ordination in the United Methodist Church as well as pursuing uh, 
further studies in biblical studies. And so I went off to Durham and really some of the, what I would call the golden years of Durham. And, and uh, I was really the last doctoral student accepted by C.K. Barrett, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, I mean, he was the leading New Testament scholar of Methodist orbit in, in all of Europe. Mm-hmm. And so I, I studied with him and Charles Cranfield and T.H.L. Parker and Luther and Calvin studies and Stephen Sykes later became Archbishop. And I mean, it was incredible. Uh, John Rogerson in Old Testament and Qumran. Mm-hmm. And um, so, you know, even though it was a research degree, mm-hmm. a PhD dissertation, I took a ton of classes on top of all that. Yeah. And so I, I came through all that education with what I would only call, a, you know, an extremely rich experience of, of learning from some of the great minds who were experts in the New Testament uh, and who were people of faith, who were people of Christian faith as well. And uh, so, you know, I felt I was well prepared Mm-hmm. Came back to North Carolina and pastored four churches in the middle of North Carolina while teaching part time at High Point College, mm-hmm. and then at Duke, and and eventually uh, I took a church in Hendersonville, North Carolina, up in the mountains. Wow. And uh, Ashland Seminary called me and said, "We want you to come." And uh, so I'm one of those rare people that really has never applied. Mm-hmm specific for a teaching job. They've just sort of come after me. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, you know, it's been, it's been a blessed journey. I had 11 good years at Ashland and now I've had over 25 years here at Asbury mm-hmm. and it's been great. So I, you know, no complaints. I had a wonderful education and it led to quite a lot of writing to say the least. Mm-hmm. And I would say one thing about that which is that in my tradition, which is conservative or evangelical Methodism, Mm -hmm. there had never been a single scholar who had written a commentary on every book of the New Testament or the Old Testament or any of that. You know, it was very hit or miss. It was never systematic like Calvin worked through the canon or Luther or any of that. Mm -hmm. And I I felt like this was a rather big lacuna or gap. In Methodism and especially uh, bibliocentric Methodism, so I kind of committed myself early on to do something about that if I could, and if I had time and energy and brain power to get it done. And so that's kind of the mission I set for myself when I went off to Ashland, and mm-hmm. and uh, you know that's that's kind of what set the trajectory for my career. Yes, and uh, you know in your book you say that, you know, you're more of a New Testament scholar, and it's a tall order to write a biblical theology covering, you know, both Testaments. But as a sort of preparation, you have written three preliminary books on the New Testament use of the Old in in the law, I think, in the Psalms and in Isaiah. Uh, Can you tell our listeners how these works fed into your biblical theology project? Sure. Well, and by way of background, I did teach Old Testament for 11 years at Ashland Seminary as well as New Testament. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I had to be on top of my game in regard to the Old Testament as well. And, right. and I especially loved teaching wisdom literature of the Old Testament. So that that certainly influenced me along the way. But the three volumes you're talking about are I, volumes I did with Fortress on intertextuality because I really I wanted to understand the relationship between the Old and the New Testament. And specifically, I really wanted to understand how the New Testament writers were using the Old Testament. Why is it that uh, Genesis and Deuteronomy, Isaiah, and the Psalms are clearly the four biggest go-to volumes that are either quoted, alluded to, or echoed in the New Testament over and over and over again? Absolutely. Well, I wanted to understand that. And so I felt like uh, I had to do those studies in their textuality before I could even get to writing a biblical theology. Yes. Now, definitions are very important. And uh, in your book, start out uh, by citing James Mead, who was maybe one of the early writers within uh, more recent uh, North American evangelicalism who uh, defines biblical theology. At least he 
you know, unless, unlike some others who never really even define it clearly, he does offer a definition. Of, I'll read it here and have you comment on it. He says that biblical theology seeks to identify and understand the Bible's theological message and themes, that is, what the Bible says about God and God's relationship to all creation, especially uh, humankind. So then in keeping with that definition, you set out to write a biblical theology that is God-centered, or perhaps better, that's Trinitarian in nature with a focus on the three persons of the Godhead, uh, Yahweh, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. And so you have a preliminary chapter, chapter one, where you uh, set the stage, but then chapters two, three, and four are on the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, respectively. So perhaps you can elaborate as we get started talking about your, your biblical theology, you can elaborate a bit on the way in which this foundational conviction shaped the structure of your entire book. Well, the thing that has always struck me about previous efforts at biblical theology is they tend to be done from a late Western abstract perspective in regard to themes. Mm-hmm. It's tracing themes throughout the canon, and there's nothing wrong with that. But for me, I wanted to try to think like the biblical writers thought themselves about all of this. And they simply take for granted that there is a living God, and there's only one of those, right? There's a living God, Mm -hmm. and that's what they presuppose. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of three layers to what's going on in my biblical theology volume. There's the presuppositions, which are usually called the symbolic universe. What do they take for granted? What's the foundation they stand on? Well, obviously, it's the doctrine of their belief in monotheism, Mm -hmm. in God, right? And uh, so I wanted to deal with the doctrine of God first as their presupposition, Mm -hmm. and then uh, out of that symbolic universe, they tell stories because narrative is how they understood their religion. It's how they understood the world. It's how they understood themselves. And so they were telling stories. Uh, There was a narrative thought world to both the Old Testament and the New Testament with plenty of overlap between those two things. And um, from, from there, out of those stories, they theologized and emphasized into particular situations and in various ways. So there, there was the layer of the foundation layer of the symbolic universe. There was the narrative thought world. And out of that was the theologizing. Mm-hmm. And, and so I tried to follow that process mm-hmm. in the way I set up the volume so that, that, and to see where that led. Because one of the big problems, Andreas, that, that I come across again and again mm-hmm. is obviously anachronism. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's almost impossible to avoid. We, we, we swim in the ocean of our current culture, and mm-hmm. it's b- very difficult not to read back into the biblical text uh, later theologies, whether it's patristic theology, Roman Catholic theology, Orthodox theology, Reformed theology, Pentecostal theology, you name it. Mm-hmm. And I, what always struck me is the biblical writers were completely innocent of all of that. Those are developments out of the canon into modernity. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were dealing strictly with what we would call naked biblical theology. Uh, they were dealing with their encounters with God, their experience of God, the redemptive work of God, and all of that. And to do justice to that, what we sort of have to do is, uh, you know, I like to say a text without a context is just a pretext for whatever you want it to mean. Mm-hmm. I wanted to set aside as best I could the modern context. Uh, and so, in dealing with the Old Testament, I wanted to allow the Old Testament to have its own say. Mm -hmm. Now, what did this mean to the original audiences, multiple audiences of God's people in Old Testament times? How did they understand God? Um, What were they thinking about when they theologized, those sorts of things? So I did my best to try to avoid uh, anachronisms 
uh, one way or, or another in setting up the book. Absolutely. And again, there's no substitute, even though our conversation, you know, we try to go as deep as we can for people actually reading your book. And I think, you know, I hope many will pick it up and read it. And if they do, I think, and when they do, what will they will discover is that that you really put a lot of weight on progressive, uh, you know, revelation, biblical theology in, in, in its classic sense, you know, is essentially a inductive, uh, you know, unfolding, evolving, you know, uh, proposition. I, I recently published a book on the Holy Spirit. And so I, I resonate with you very deeply. Uh, you know, again, I'm more a New Testament scholar, but I, I had to cover the Old Testament as well. And uh, what I found there is that, I mean, there's a clear sense of development that, you know, you defies uh, anachronism. And so I think that resonates me, with, with me very strongly. And I think you do that very well in your uh, all three chapters, really, on, on, on Yahweh, on, on Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, that, that, you know, you just track with the, with the story, uh, with the narrative uh, world of Scripture, uh, and you, you allow the Old Testament to speak for itself. Along those lines, you know, I, I'm just curious, this is a bit unscripted, but, but what would you say to people who talk about, say, Adam and Eve being, you know, priests in, in, in the, the temple of, of Eden and, and, you know, who, who, who see essentially uh, a lot of those uh, later theological, you know, constructs, if you will, already in place, you know, in Genesis 1 and 2? Yeah, I, I I would call that an overreading of Genesis one and two. Uh-huh. I mean, uh, a garden is not a temple, and a temple is not a garden, and it's called a gun, you know. And uh-huh. so, and and the other part of this is, I mean, temple religion presupposes a sacred zone and a non-sacred zone. Uh-huh. But if I'm understanding Genesis one and two. Everywhere was sacred space Mm -hmm. when God first created, before there was sin and the fall and need for redemption and need for temple and need for God to have a zone, if you will. Uh, That was just not necessary in Genesis 1 and 2. So I, you know, I don't, I mean, Adam and Eve are not offering sacrifice. When are the first sacrifices? Mm -hmm. Cain and Abel, right? right? I mean, it's after it's after the fall that we need priests and temples and sacrifices. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I, I think that's an overreading of Genesis one and two. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So again, it's, it's fascinating to think about the relationship between uh, biblical theology and hermeneutics. And so clearly, uh, you know, talking about presuppositions, obviously you have a uh, certain uh, hermeneutical convictions that you bring to the task of doing biblical theology, and and big part of that is is as we mentioned to avoid anachronism to to track with the biblical narrative uh, as the readers at the time would have understood it. Now you do of course allow for uh, you know what scholars call census plenier, uh, meaning that, that that there's a sense in which later inspired writers might uh, pick up on earlier texts and and tease out the entailments uh, further. So that's obviously something different, but maybe you can expand on that a bit as well for our listeners. Sure. Um, I, I think there's no question that, I mean, if just on the basis of Hebrews, you, you have to accept that the New Testament writers thought in terms of typology. Uh, and, and typology is a historical way of looking at the development of, the people of God and progressive revelation, right? There's a before and there after. And so the before is foreshadowing. There's antecedents uh, and, and many foreshadowing. And God in his larger vision of things is not surprised by all this, right? He, this is part of his larger plan. But foreshadowings are not foretastes. So one of the things I say again and again, is there was no actual incarnation before the incarnation, right? There was no physical presence of the Christ before he took on flesh in the womb of Mary. And um, But that does not mean that the Son of God was not involved in creation and in sustaining God's people along the way. But the way the New Testament writers talk about that is not in terms of him being the angel of the Lord showing up 
you know, here, there, and yonder, or you know, at the burning bush, or he's one of the three people that showed up for Abraham's dinner party, or anything like that. Right. Now, the way right. they talk about it is that he is that mysterious figure called wisdom, who is with God in the beginning and is involved in the creation of the universe and the guidance of God's people and calls them to repentance and calls them to come back to God. And so there's certainly ways to see all kinds of foreshadowing in the Old Testament that come to fruition and fulfillment in Christ. And so that that's the way I'd want to, uh, to deal with it. And uh, so, you know, when you deal, let's deal with a particular text just for a minute. In 1 Corinthians 10, where Paul says, and the rock was Christ. Mm. Now, what's interesting about that is he has been reflecting on the wisdom of Solomon, where we are told quite specifically, and the rock that provided water to the wilderness wandering generation was God's wisdom. Okay. <laughs> Paul is not saying that Jesus was a piece of igneous matter back there during the wilderness wandering period. Right. He's saying... Right that Christ was involved as, as God's wisdom in giving guidance to God's people and, and nourishment to God's people along the way. Uh, and so you have to have a sense of the whole progress of Revelation from foreshadowing to fulfillment to really get a sense of that. And you, you need to be able to not try to overread the Old Testament. The Old Testament have its own say. Because God's people were given revelation piecemeal along the way. And obviously, that's all God wanted to give them then. And it was good enough to sustain a relationship with God then. Mm -hmm. And so you have to do justice to that. So, you know, I'm, I, I'm sympathetic to Old Testament scholars like John Golden Gay who say, let the Old Testament be the Old Testament. I'm going, well, yes, but you can't stop there because of all the fulfillment of Old Testament themes, ideas, and mm -hmm. purpose mm -hmm. in Christ and in the New Testament. So you need to have a sense of progressive revelation, but you also need to have a sense of progressive understanding by God's people. I mean, there's a reason why in the early part of the Old Testament, we just have this idea of shield the land of the dead, people are dying and being gathered to their ancestors. And unless your name begins with E, Elijah or Enoch, you're not beamed up. <laughs> you're just gathered to your ancestors. But then when you get to the exiles and you're dealing with exilic literature, all of a sudden you have this growing, robust theology of the afterlife, yeah. which is really not in the Pentateuch. It's just not there. Right. And so you have, have to have a sense of the development of soteriology and a theology of the afterlife. I mean, finally, in Daniel 12, we somebody clears their throat and says, by the way, there's going to be a bodily resurrection right. of right. individuals, a good one and a bad one. Mm -hmm. and, uh, okay. and so we're by then we're off and running to a more robust mm -hmm. theology of afterlife. So if you don't have that sense of, progressive revelation, you're really not going to understand the canon. For me, the, the wake-up call came when I had to teach First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and First and Second Chronicles. And boy, oh boy, was that a job. And the thing that struck me is that when the chronicler told the same stories as we had already heard in Samuel and Kings, he often had a different perspective as to what was going on. For example, things previously predicated of Yahweh were now predicated of Hasatan, Satan. And I'm going, huh, okay, <laughs> what are we to make of that? God is not the devil, and the devil is not God. Uh -huh. But what I made of that was that God, through progressive revelation and progressive understanding of the revelation, had finally made clear to his people that there were secondary causes, yeah. like the adversary. And you see that, of course, robustly in Job as well. You know, the, the adversary is going to go test Job. Uh, 
and he's not supposed to test him past his power to endure and so on. So it seemed clear to me the more I reflected on these developments across the Old Testament canon and over time chronologically, that you have to have a theology of progressive revelation and progressive understanding of the revelation to make sense of all that stuff. Mm, yeah. I One thing I really like about your biblical theology, it's very creative, and I think you speak out against two kind of, you know, mechanical, kind of rigid uh, approaches that, that, that deal with things like you mentioned earlier in our podcast, more on an abstract, thematic level. Uh, you know, so I really commend you for trying to be, you know, holistic and thinking both about, you know, things maybe that are even just presupposed, uh, other parts that are just part of a story, the, you know, meta narrative of Scripture. And even when it comes to the New Testament, the use of the Old Testament, you're saying it's not even primarily always exegetically driven. It might be homiletically driven, or, uh, you know, there may be some, again, larger theological. Um, you know, story elements that are in view. And so I think it, it is really refreshing to, to see someone take the text seriously, uh, but, but not to be, you know, clinging to the text in a way that, that kind of misses more the, the intangibles, right? The, 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 the way in which people would have, would have likely conceived of God and his relation to the world, as we talked about earlier. So maybe talk to us a little bit more about, you know, your approach. Uh, you have we talked about the first uh, three chapters are in God, uh, Jesus, and the Spirit, and the second part is on uh, the storied world of, world of the Bible, Old New Testament, and then the third part is you start in Genesis again, and then you do a, a bit of a thematic uh, study of, of, of the covenant theme and some other themes, so maybe you can help us kind of put it together, you know, how, how come you start with, with God, and you, you look at the storied world of the, world of the Bible, then you talk about themes like the covenant, uh, maybe just unpack that a bit. Well, sure. Uh, and one of the things I think this kind of approach to biblical theology, of it's like building a layer cake. You know, if you start with the foundation and then work through the narrative thought world. And I am utterly convinced that that's how the writers of the New Testament thought about the Old Testament again and again. I mean, when when Paul thinks of sin, he thinks of the story of Adam. When Paul thinks of justification by grace through faith, he thinks of the story of Abraham. You know, I mean, we could just keep going like that. I mean, he thinks of these theological ideas that we've abstracted and connected in various ways in terms of the stories out of which these ideas arise. And I assume that that's how we should think about it. As well, because there are clues in the story that help you to understand this. I mean, for example, I one of my favorite texts to preach is First Kings 19. Elijah's little trip to Mount Horeb when he's ready to give up being a prophet and, and just sort of resign. And the thing that has struck me about recently preaching this story is the climax there where we are told by the narrator there was a great fire, but God was not in the fire. There was an earthquake, but God was not in the earthquake. I mean, there's all this conflagration. There's all of this stuff. But the point is you can't read God's will by just looking at natural disasters. Like the current pandemic. You just can't do that. You have to listen to the still small voice of God. The, the revelation that comes through creation is real, but it's very diffuse and general. Mm -hmm. If you want a specific understanding of God's specific will for humankind, you have to live, listen to not general revelation so much as specific revelation, the word of God. And it, it's really struck me how you know, so many preachers that I've been hearing over the last five months have not gotten the memo about this. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was one in Minnesota who shall remain nameless who wanted to say, OK, it's perfectly clear that this is God's judgment on all the sin in America. Mm -hmm. Well, if that's what it is, 
we would need to be asking questions like, why is it specifically targeting people with precondition, pre-existing conditions in old people? I mean, does God just really have that bad a aim? You know, I mean, what's the deal here? Mm-hmm. How come it's not targeting the red leg district or whatever? Mm-hmm. You know, and so I think when you really think of biblical theology writ large and think about it in the sequence that I laid it out, yeah. then then you are one of the things that does for you is prevent you from jumping to conclusions or doing just sort of a flat reading of particular texts that are really not making the point that you want to make yeah. at all. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're proof texting, and that's not what the text actually is telling us. So, you know, that's that's part of the deal. And the other part of the deal is that um, when we get to the New Testament and we have this robust theology of salvation and eschatology and Christology and on and on and on, I don't think it's an accident that you know, in our in our very earliest uh, gospel, including Mark and Matthew, immediately on page one of those gospels, where we are forced to start thinking trinitarianly, because there's the voice of God, there's the Spirit descending, and there's the Son, and, and you know, I mean, the church fathers weren't wrong about this. This is the first clearly Trinitarian text. Well, why? Because all of the progressive revelation has been converging on making us understand better that there is a triune God, mm-hmm. and that that the, the can that's where the canon is really going. That's the trajectory of all these stories. So that by the time you get to Paul and the post Pauline letters and Book of Revelation. You have already got the raw material for a doctrine of the Trinity right there, but starting with the baptism of Jesus. And, um, you know, it to me, that's exciting. God had a plan, and he knew that the Old Testament people of God could not swallow this whole back in whatever B.C. And so he gradually, piecemeal and partially, as Hebrews 1 says, revealed his plan, his nature, his purposes, his covenants as time went on uh, to lead to the climax of having a robust understanding of one God in three persons. Yes, uh, thank you. I think that for our listeners is very helpful in, in explaining the subtitle of your biblical theology, The Convergence of the Canon. You know, I think I recently uh, read someone I think you came out of more a theological interpretation of Scripture approach, saying when we read Scripture, like hermeneutically, we have to pretty much presuppose and start with the Trinity. So if I hear you correctly, that's not exactly what you're saying, right? Uh, Because (laughs) you're saying that the the, the themes um, unfold gradually in the Old Testament, and, and the convergence of the canon happens initially, at least in the Gospels. Is that correct? That's exactly right. And and so when we see the Gospel writers and then subsequent New Testament writers um, homiletically using the Old Testament to make what I will call New Testament points, we need to understand that they are creatively using the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. That's what they're doing. They're like so many preachers who are creative. That's what they're doing. They're not just doing hardcore exegesis. Like the example I gave before, 1 Corinthians 10, it's the rock mm-hmm. was Christ, right? What is he doing there? He's explaining that God always had a salvific purpose and that Christ was always involved in it as the preexistent son of God mm-hmm. along the way. But we would not have known that from reading the wilderness wandering narrative. Right. We would not have ever known that just by reading those stories. And so it's only in light of Christ and the Christ event and the subsequent events of Pentecost that we can look back and say, oh, well, this is where all of that was going. And and so, I mean, this is another reason we need biblical theology, which is not simply Old Testament theology plus New Testament theology equals biblical theology. We need to have a sense of the trajectory of the whole shebang to make sense of the part. 
Yes. Uh, one example that maybe you could uh, talk about briefly in terms of, uh, you know, the story of Scripture and how that reverberates in in the New Testament. Uh, I had the privilege uh, as a Jets editor a few years back to publish an article of yours. I think it was a lecture originally on uh, Romans 7, uh, you know, 13 to 25, of course. Uh, there's as many interpretations of that text as there's commentaries. Uh, but uh, again, maybe you can uh, reinforce what you've been saying uh, about stories being important, uh, especially for Paul and the other New Testament writers using that uh, uh, Romans 7 text as a bit of a case study. Well, yeah. And as you know, as well as I do, this is the most doctoral dissertated passage in the whole Bible. (laughs) There are more doctoral dissertated, and there are more monographs on Romans 7 since the Reformation than any other passage of Scripture. So you're right. Put 10 scholars in a room, you're going to get 15 opinions about this. That's so true. But to me, the real aha moment comes uh, when you're reading Romans 7, um, you know, 7 to 13, uh, before you get to 14 to 25. And you realize what's actually going on here is Paul creatively is retelling the story of Adam. I mean, if you ask questions like, who existed before there was any law? Well, there's only one, two persons, Adam and Eve. That's all. And this person existed before there was a law. Okay, well, who could this possibly be? So he's creatively retelling the story of Adam and the fall in Romans 7, 7 to 13. And then he, in 14 through 25, he's telling the story of those who are in Adam ever since and not yet in Christ. So, sorry, Luther, you were just wrong about that. Um, you know, and, and, and the proof of that comes in uh, 7, 4, and 5, and 8, 1 through 4. I mean, if you affirm what Romans 8, 1 through 4 says, the Spirit has set us free from the law of sin and death. Okay, that doesn't sound to me like we're still in bondage to sin anymore. You know, if it is true that the Spirit has set us free from the law of sin and death. um, And, I mean, look at at the before and after of uh, Romans 7. Where, where he talks about in verses 4 and 5 and 6 and 7, we used to be this way, but now we're this way. So I'm going to retell the story of Adam here. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's called speech and character. He's speaking in the first person, but we know personally well that he, perfectly well, that he's not talking about himself. How do we know this? Well, read Philippians. Paul says about his previous life in Judaism, He says, in regard to a righteousness that comes from the law, I was blameless. Hello. (laughs) How do you reconcile that with the description in Romans 7, 14 through 25? Well, you just can't. It doesn't work. So what is he, Paul, doing? He's, He's presenting a Christian view now, after he's in Christ, of the pre Christian condition of Adam and the fall, and then the pre-Christian condition of those who are in Adam. Now, they would not necessarily have seen it that way themselves. Certainly, Paul didn't see it that way himself when he was in early Judaism. But if you don't understand the storied world out of which Paul is thinking, you're going to miss all of that. Absolutely. I definitely refer um, our listeners, if they're interested, to the Jets article that they can uh, find on the internet and read for themselves to get just the full uh, benefit of, of of your argument there. And I think by now our listeners probably realize that you and I could probably <laughs> talk for a long time because uh, uh, talking about convergence, there's there's just honestly a lot of convergence between, you know, what you're saying and, and you know, some of my own views. I've mentioned to you before our podcast. I'm currently working on a Biblical theology of my own, uh, Lord willing. So working through your book has been just incredibly stimulating and in, in just thinking through some of those perennial issues. Uh, again, as you said, uh, trying to to retrace the steps of the biblical authors themselves uh, 
not overreading uh, scripture, imposing some alien framework or, you know, too rigid framework on it, striking the right balance. Uh, I think you're doing an excellent job on between the diversity and the unity of scripture. Appreciate your high view of scripture, your focus on Jesus, on the gospel, your creativity, your seasoning that's evident on every page. Again, on behalf of myself and our listeners, uh, many thanks, uh, Ben, for joining us today. My great pleasure. And may I just say that for those who may see some gaps in my biblical theology, well, yes, it's not meant to be exhausting or exhaustive. Mm -hmm. So I've done a separate small study Mm -hmm. called The Character of God, just published last April by by Lexham on uh, the moral character of God. And it focuses on nouns rather than adjectives. It focuses on God is love, God is life, God is light, God is spirit, God is one, to reveal something of the moral character of God that is unchanging. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today at Biblical Foundations. For more information, please visit the Center for Biblical Studies at Midwestern at cbs.mbts.edu. For further resources, please also visit biblicalfoundations.org. Please join us again next time at the Biblical Foundations podcast.